thank you so, so much for jumping on. We're really, really excited about today's topic. It's a personal favorite of mine. Hi, Carrie. It's a personal favorite of mine because it is something that really started to shift my relationship with my body, with my relationship to fitness, just really starting to learn that BMI really doesn't need to be your focus in health and doesn't dictate your health. And I am not going to give away all of the goodies that we're about to get from this presentation, but the science is really starting to be better communicated and more out there that we don't need to stress this and it doesn't need to be something that makes you feel less than because as we know, everyone in this group is more than enough as they are. And we're here to really bring this body positive and empowered community together. So I think we got a big group of people in awesome. I am Abby Griffith. I'm the owner and founder of Clarity Fitness, which is Georgia's first body positive wellness center. We have an online portal as of January 1st, so we're super excited about that. That's called Clarity Online, and I'll share all the links and stuff in the chat as we go, but it's a really cool platform that's half on-demand fitness, body positive, of course, and then half live community groups, webinars like this one, body positive topics for moms, for runners, for just general body positive goodness and empowerment throughout your week. And it's some really cool stuff, bringing people that are like-minded together and bringing some positivity to whatever it is that might be on your mind throughout the week. So we're really, really excited to bring speakers together like Kelsey, who are crushing it in our space and who are really bringing the science to light, who are really bringing their own experiences and their own view of what we're doing to the forefront of this conversation. So thank you, Kelsey. And without further ado, I want to kick off this webinar with our amazing speaker. She is a student at the University of Hartford and has been in the eating disorder field for five years. She is a goddess queen at all that she does. And she is really focused on researching weight stigma, which is another big passion of mine. And I cannot wait to pick her brain during this webinar and after. And without further ado, I will pass it to Kelsey. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, so like Abby said, um, I'm a doctoral student in clinical psychology at the University of Hartford. Um, my clinical and research work for nearly five years has been primarily in eating disorders um, and both in like residential and outpatient levels of care and clinical research settings. Um, I am currently a practicum student at a college counseling site um, where I also work with um, college students who have eating disorders. Um, and I, I am working on research for weight stigma and intuitive eating. Um, and so the topic of BMI and um, why it doesn't really matter in terms of health um, and the related topics involved in this presentation are important to me. And so I hope that after today, um, they're also important to you if they aren't already. Um, so, uh, what is BMI? So, um, we know that it stands for body mass index, right? But what does that even mean? Um, so basically the BMI is an anthropometric calculation or basically a measurement tool um, used in like scientific study of the measurements and proportions of the human body. Um, this calculation includes weight divided by height. Um, a common misconception is that the BMI depicts the amount of body fat a person may have, um, but it actually determines the presence of excess weight and is referred to as like a surrogate measure of body fat. So it doesn't actually measure direct body fat. Um, basically, the BMI also doesn't account for like bone, water, genetics, um, or muscle um, within the body. So in the calculation, as it is, it's only made up of height and weight of an individual. Um, so those other aspects of what's involved in a body, like bones, <laughs> water, muscle tissue, fat, um, they're not calculated in that. And those are you know, pretty vital uh, pieces to the body and they definitely influence that. 
Um, and so the BMI also determines weight categories as well. And so these categories uh, also use um, outdated and stigmatizing language. Um, and I wanna kind of preface that. Um, I will mention the categories by name, um, but I do not endorse the use of these words. Um, I'm just kind of talking about it as um, it is and has, as it exists, uh, but I would never kind of um, endorse the use of some of these words. And so the categories are underweight, um, normal weight, uh, overweight, and obese. And each of these categories have a respective number and um, a number range for the BMI. Um, and the results of that BMI calculation can be impacted also by pregnancy, um, muscle mass, and kind of is a controversial measure of health for children and older adults. So basically, the purpose of the BMI is that it's a population-based measure to track weight status. Um, it's a screening tool for healthcare providers in order to decide whether or not um, a patient is at risk for maybe a correlated health risk. Um, so with that, um, you, I'm sure you've all heard too that depending on what your BMI is, there's correlated health risks. Like if you have a higher BMI, um, you're at greater risk for developing things like type 2 diabetes, um, heart conditions, cholesterol, blood pressure issues, um, a lot of different things. And so healthcare providers may um, use that as a tool to potentially screen for those things. Um, but then it's also um, a little uh, kind of like a double-edged sword where it's not only used as screening, but then people kind of use that as another means of um, kind of perpetuating weight stigma and that you aren't healthy because you're now at risk for these things. Um, and we'll talk about how that's a little arbitrary too later on. Um, but research has also demonstrated uh, that some higher weight individuals actually have lower cardiovascular risk and improved metabolic profiles while some individuals with a normal BMI um, are metabolically unhealthy and have increased risk of mortality. Um, and so we have to remember that health is so individual and you really can't group people by numbers. Um, there's a lot of other aspects that determine health and it's not just kind of physical and body weight related. Um, there's a lot of other determinants of health. And so the CDC itself, um, the Center for Disease Control, um, also recommends that the BMI should be used as a measure to track weight status in populations and as a screening tool to identify those potential weight-related problems in individuals. Um, so even though that is endorsed by the CDC, we're going to circle back to the purpose of the BMI's use um, compared to how it is actually, uh, actually used today. And so I also just wanted to show you what the actual BMI equation looks like. Um, I did show this to uh, my boyfriend. He really likes math and he was telling me how actually incorrect the calculation itself is um, just based in, uh, it doesn't really make sense to square height. Um, and this is also something too that um, this calculation has been altered to fit the data um, that it was created with. So. Um, they altered the actual equation to fit the data rather than the equation kind of being an actual representation of the data. So that's a big no-no in research to alter your outcomes <laughs> based on the data you receive. It's uh, malpractice for sure. So um, the history of the BMI. Um, it was developed um, it, by this person named Lambert uh, Quadelet. He is a Belgian mathematician. Um, and he created the BMI in the 1830s. It's important to note that um, he was not a physician and he had no medical background and he created the BMI to measure the presence of higher weight individuals of a population for the government in order to distribute resources. Um, and, and that was it. So he was a statistician who uh, tried to divide up uh, people based on a certain demographic like weight. Um, and that's it. there was actually no kind of medical purpose for the development of the BMI. Um, he created it by sampling populations in different regions of the country, and then he obtained averages through using statistical analysis, and he determined what the norm was for each population. And so the participants, though, he sampled um, only included white Europeans, mostly males. Um, therefore, this was not a representative sample in terms of populations outside of those regions, uh, race, 
gender, sexuality, everything like that. So in statistics, you actually cannot generalize those findings to a population who was not involved in the sample. So the sample is quite limited. Um, so he created this measure um, and created an index in which you would compare what your BMI is to those norms listed. So this was eventually applied actually across all races, ethnicities, and countries. Um, again, a big no-no in research. Um, so to circle back uh, to the recommended use of the BMI too by the CDC, um, uh, who uses it now uh, is researchers, medical doctors, public health initiatives, government agencies, diagnostic tools, and insurance companies. Um, and so it kind of goes against that CDC recommendation that it should not be used as a diagnostic tool, but just something to kind of give um, some information of potential testing that might need to be done um, and to group people by population rather than actually used in all of these different domains. And so um, in particular, researchers might use it as a criteria for eligibility to enroll in a study or use it to guide statistical analysis. Some medical doctors might use it to guide their practice while others might consider it as a main factor for um, kind of like ordering diagnostic testing and assuming the health of their patients. As, addition, as an additional diagnostic tool, it is used in the DSM-5 in order to diagnose anorexia nervosa and to also specify the severity of the case. So those who do not meet the BMI criteria are placed in an other group. And so in that other group, um, they're classified as an atypical case of an eating disorder. And so that can be very, um, dangerous to kind of mislabel because they are actually just as severe. This person might just not meet the same weight status, but it doesn't mean the actual physical effects of an eating disorder um, don't kind of measure up to someone who might be in that BMI category of underweight. Um, so this can also create barriers to treatment. Um, and uh, I would say this also has implications for like insurance, th insurance authorizations as well, healthcare providers bias and identifying eating disorders and research studies for enrolling participants. Um, and so again, it's not meant to be a diagnostic tool yet it is included as a diagnostic criteria and does lead to medical bias. And so that's my spiel. I'll always kind of bring it back to kind of the research that I'm familiar with. Uh, and so, um, for public health initiatives um, and government agencies, um, they both use the BMI in an effort to promote health or label issues of public health, like their term, the obesity em epidemic um, in the United States. Um, I do also want to stress that the term obesity is one of the terms that I was um, referring to earlier, that it is um, classified as an oppressive term, and it is identified that way for people who have experienced um, uh, weight-based depression. Um, so if you do use it or you hear people use it, um, just something to keep in mind um, that, you know, changing language is important to be inclusive and to be respectful. Um, but for this obesity epidemic that was declared in the United States, an example of a public health initiative for that is Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, um, which had encouraged healthier foods in schools um, and uh, better food labeling, so labeling a lot more in detail. Um, and more physical activity for children. And so that can be framed as a really positive thing, especially in diet culture. You could be like, oh, what a great initiative. Um, but then it really focused on the childhood obesity epidemic that they termed. Um, so it was really solely perpetuating fat phobic messages to kids, um, like they need to lose weight or control their weight um, instead of promoting like healthful behaviors, right? Um, so a healthful behavior is exercise and a healthful behavior is eating food that makes you feel good and serves you. Um, and that's different for everybody that looks different for everyone. And so they were really trying to sell, you know, this one kind of one size fits all health approach, which is just not the case. For government agencies, um, they've also changed the threshold of the BMI regarding what is considered to be overweight. Um, so when this number was changed in the 90s, many Americans who were once in the normal weight category were bumped into the overweight category, and they were now considered a greater risk for illness, as their BMI now suggests. 
um, but maybe like the day before that their BMI was within that normal range and they weren't at risk for those things. Um, so this really kind of shows in and of itself that the BMI is actually quite arbitrary in that way, that if you can just change it to mean something different one day to the next, um, does it really mean that? Is it really an accurate indicator? We have good old insurance companies. Um, so if you live in the United States, uh, you are aware of the insurance system and how um, it can be incredibly unfair, stigmatizing, um, and uh, more so a pain in the butt than anything else. So um, starting in the 1970s, health and life insurance companies used the BMI to determine their health insurance premiums or their life insurance premiums um, by predicting like life expectancy um, and decided um, if you have a BMI in the overweight or above categories, you are considered a risk to the company, therefore you have to pay more, um, which is just wrong. <laughs> it kind of completely ignores body size diversity in the first place. And that the BMI again ignores all the other parts of your body like bone density, everything else. And so your BMI could very well be in a category that otherwise people wouldn't kind of guess that you would be in in that way. Um, I think it's so important to note that it was only for the overweight and above categories that they changed the premiums, not for anything like underweight and below, even though there are very known health risks also associated with those BMI categories. So that just therefore highlights more um, fat phobia. And so this is something that I thought would be really important to talk about as well, um, just given that um, everything we've gone through in the past year as well. Um, this is something that should be brought up in, and that is racism and the BMI. Um, so the BMI again was created using a sample that only included white European people. Um, so therefore this measurement is not reflective of um, differences across race and ethnicity and the world in general. Um, so it's really considered a Eurocentric determinant of health. Um, Quadale, um, the creator, used math in an attempt to also identify what the ideal man would look like. And he um, was also a sociologist, and a lot of his research was dedicated to what makes the ideal man. Um, and I think we can guess that the ideal man would have been a thin white male, um, and that would have been what would be ideal for, for him in that age. Um, the BMI is also used in arguments for eugenics. So again, going back to that ideal man, what makes an ideal person? And so that is definitely someone who is in um, normal or um, the underweight categories. And it ignores kind of those systemic issues behind health and wellness as well. Um, so we know that, you know, health isn't just physical and it's not, you know, exactly just what you eat and how often you move your body and how you do it but it's actually very much impacted by social issues as well, stress, um, like lack of sleep. Um, are you doing joyful things every day? Uh, there's many different you know, reasons for health and what really influences it. And so the BMI completely ignores that and it ignores those systemic issues behind that. So stress, access to healthcare and poverty, um, and these issues are also more likely to impact people of color. And so then we talk about kind of fat phobia and BMI. And I think I've already been highlighting this probably the entire talk so far. Um, but given how higher weights, larger bodies, and body fat um, are talked about and demonized, we have diet culture, and that is at play. And it is influenced by a multi billion dollar diet industry. This diet industry thrives on perpetuating fat phobic messages um, and the thin ideal to lower self-esteem and motivate people to buy their products to change their body in order to fit the ideal. Um, and so this is especially prominent in the month of January, I would say, with a lot of like weight loss campaigns and body goals and these messages can be really hard to escape. Um, I know that um, I've really tailored my social media to be very much like body neutral, body positive, um, and I still get those messages sent to me. So I can really only imagine someone who um, doesn't kind of uh, do the same kind of social media behaviors that I do and what messages they're getting right now. Um, and then we talk about those weight categories again. And something that comes up is a term that's used in research and it's called the obesity paradox. 
Um, and so this is basically um, like a proposition or an idea um, based on research that despite the fact that the risk of certain illnesses increases with a higher BMI, um, people actually tend to live longer on average if their BMI is on the higher end compared to um, the lower end counterparts. And so this term, the obesity paradox in research is thrown around quite a bit um, as if it's so hard to comprehend that people in um, different bodies can live you know, healthy lives um, when it doesn't really fit data that is inherently biased with um, kind of the BMI being um, something that categorizes people. And so even with this evidence and realization, um, fat phobia is still very much rampant in the healthcare field and research and in general culture. And I also wanted to talk about kind of the myths pursuing weight loss. Um, I'm sure you're seeing them now. We see them all the time. Um, but uh, there's important myths of the sole fact that the vast majority of individuals who lose significant amounts of weight um, through kind of like dieting and falling into diet culture um, are actually likely um, to um, later on gain back plus additional weight um, following that weight loss and diet plans. Um, and so something that's actually more dangerous is kind of weight cycling and yo-yoing with weight um, that actually has substantial impacts on blood pressure and other measures of um, biological measures of health um, within the body. And so there are many potential reasons for this, um, but uh, in particular, pursuing weight loss is, um, it's not the same as making like health-related changes in living. Um, so these changes encompass, um, you know, all of what makes up health, not just dieting and exercising. Um, so again, are you sleeping enough? Um, what does your stress level look like? Do you have access to um, the foods that, you know, nourish your body? Because it's going to be different from foods that nourish someone else's body. Do you have access to, you know, being able to engage in joyful movement and physical activity? Um, or are you working 24 seven to afford your life, right? There's a lot of different, um, again, reasons for what health is. Um, and so within that, there's also a message that we receive from diet culture that pursuing weight loss will actually make you happy. However, weight changes will not resolve any, um, any like emotional turmoil and it's not going to give you any emotional peace. It's not going to improve body image. Um, there's still something there. There's still beliefs and ideas um, that you kind of hold about your body that need to be worked on and changing your weight is not going to do that for you. Um, so therefore, losing weight does not mean someone is healthier. In reality, a lifestyle consists of healthy behaviors, um, including foods that make you feel good, serve your body's needs, not depriving yourself of foods, um, the more we actually deprive ourselves of certain foods, the more likely we will have episodes of overeating with those foods. Um, joyful exercise, regular sleep, reduced stress, healthy relationships, job satisfaction, all of those things are going to be um, important indicators of health that also influence um, your weight. Ooh, I also want to say something um, before we move on is that um, you know, the diet culture focuses on diet, but it's also kind of taken on this disguise of wellness culture and health. Um, so when people say that they're uh, pursuing health in this way, um, it's just another way that diet culture has kind of disguised itself to really kind of embed itself in our culture and continue to have its grasp. And so weight stigma. Uh, um, so this is a very meaningful topic to me. Um, so weight stigma is basically the negative attitude um, or belief held about others based on their weight. And so I'm sure right now, if we took a second, we could all think of examples of um, how we've noticed, you know, throughout our lives, like what weight stigma looks like, um, examples of what that is, whether it was directed at us, someone we knew, um, and so with that, I do want you to keep those experiences in your mind as we continue to kind of dive into this topic and for the Q&A later, um, if this is something that you'd like to talk more about. So weight stigma is harmful to people of all sizes. And so um, it definitely impacts, you know, across the weight spectrum. 
Um, weight stigma is present across the lifespan, including childhood, adolescence, um, in the form of weight teasing in particular. And so this teasing is not only inflicted by peers, but also family members too. And that can all be through verbal teasing, cyberbullying, sometimes physical aggression. Um, and in the media and culture, we see weight stigma in the form of selling weight loss products. Um, and this sends a message that our bodies aren't good enough if we don't meet the ideal that their product, um, they say, will give us. Um, so you'll see things like um, before and after photos of people's weight loss transformations and other forms of weight stigma. Um, often these pictures will depict um, increases in happiness from um, larger body to smaller body. Um, however, uh, it would just be kind of attributed to their weight loss rather than the happiness that might come from the other healthful behaviors that we've talked about so far. So ultimately these transformation photos kind of perpetuate that message that larger bodies aren't good enough and they need to be changed, which is weight stigmatizing. And another way that we see weight stigma in culture is that people at higher weights are included less actually in advertisements um, compared to people at lower weights, which also does not represent the general population where body size diversity is present. Um, and I'm sure that we can also think of, you know, plenty of TV shows, movies, media in general that people at higher weights aren't included. And so um, you might be wondering, why is Kim Kardashian on our screen? Um, so Kim Kardashian, I think we all know her. <laughs> She's a very prominent figure in um, reality television, fashion, um, health and fitness, Instagram influencer, things like that. Um, and she promoted, I think this was about two years ago now, um, but she still promotes this product and similar products too, along with um, the Kardashian family, um, that this is called the flat tummy tea in particular. So these are meal replacement shakes. Um, and so that means promoting food restriction, um, eating for weight control compared to eating for nutrition and enjoyment. Um, so it's really kind of placing, you know, you're still not good enough. You still have to restrict. Um, you still have to kind of withhold food from yourself and do these things. Um, and then as far as, you know, talking about the obesity epidemic, they use dehumanizing images as well on the news, right? So that could be depicting people in larger bodies from the neck down who are just walking on the street or eating food. Um, so these are just kind of two ways that weight stigma is very much prominent in our culture um, that we might kind of not notice um, or we just kind of keep scrolling past. So weight stigma in healthcare too is yet another area um, where it's present. So in particular, research has found that while healthcare providers might feel confident in their ability to treat weight-related diagnoses, and I put that in air quotes for an important reason, um, you know, weight-related diagnoses doesn't really kind of make sense. If it was true, then people, everyone at that weight would kind of have that diagnosis. So these are just what they assume to be weight-related diagnoses that's correlated, um, and that's it. And so they felt confident in their ability to treat those diagnoses. However, they may also view their patients at higher weights as lacking motivation and as non-compliant with treatment recommendations. Um, and additional research examining nurses' weight bias found that nurses attribute weight status uh, to be controllable by the individual and that they notice their own weight bias when working with patients at higher weights. Uh, many nurses reported that weight bias um, actually affects the care they provide. Um, so weight stigma in this kind of research setting for healthcare um, is clearly rampant and it's rampant in all areas of life in multiple settings and can lead to a lot of consequences. And those consequences um, are, so weight stigma itself is actually associated with increased disordered eating, um, depression, anxiety, decreased physical activity, um, and those are just some of the things. And so then we talk about something called internalized weight bias. So weight stigma also leads to this, which is when individuals take those negative stereotypes about weight and then apply them to themselves. So then they kind of see themselves in that light. 
Um, this is also very much something that is associated with that increased depression, increased um, anxiety and disordered eating. And so after talking about this and researching it, it's really not surprising that weight stigma is so detrimental. But what is surprising is that our culture continues to be weight stigmatizing, knowing what we know at this point. And so the problem with BMI is that one, it's created by a mathematician, <laughs> um, not a physician. <laughs> he was also a sociologist, still not a physician <laughs> um, or medical professional in any way. Um, it's a calculation of just weight divided by height. It does not account for anything else other than weight divided by height. Um, so any of those social determinants of health, the other parts of your body, like your bones, um, none of that is taken into consideration in this calculation. Um, it is a population-based measure so that um, it's used to kind of track weight status in large populations. Um, and that's uh, just another way for scientists to group individuals, not a way to kind of then make, uh, therefore make sweeping judgments of people's health. Um, it has a racist history. Um, it is used for profit of insurance companies. Um, it enables fat phobia with assigned weight categories and health initiatives that result from that and it perpetuates weight stigma. And so I never like to leave off <laughs> on, you know, heavy topics like weight stigma, internalized weight bias and all of that, um, because it doesn't feel good to leave on that. So I wanted to talk about, you know, what creating a weight inclusive environment looks like, because um, that's important. You know, it can feel really helpless to then learn all of that information and be like, okay, what do I do now? So hopefully this gives you some information of where to go, but I think, um, you know, clarity uh, probably is already well on its way in terms of providing that body positivity. Um, but these are just some things that you can bring into all areas of life too. So I like to preface this with the idea that um, for valuing body size diversity um, and practicing body positivity and really trying to address any internalized weight bias that you might have so you can let go of that, um, is that, you know, there's the idea that even if we ate all the same meals, the exact same meals, the exact same time of the day, um, exercise the same amount, um, our bodies would still be different and they operate differently. Um, so let's find value in that, that beauty and the diversity of bodies and not try and, you know, place us in this package where we're all supposed to be the same. And so there's some ways to create, you know, a weight and body inclusive environment. Um, and so, you know, including pictures and messages of, you know, all body types, um, disability status, race, ethnicity, age, gender, all of that. Um, the more inclusion we can see in, in our environments, the better. Um, another important way of doing this is to always think of ways to increase accessibility. So this could be physical barriers. How do we get rid of those? It could be emotional and mental barriers um, to maybe engaging in exercise, right? So like I said earlier, with weight stigma and internalized weight bias, people are less likely to actually engage in physical activity. So how do we kind of help them through that, right? How do we create that safe space for them to feel confident and safe to exercise when, you know, environment itself hasn't really um, allowed for that? Um, and being mindful, you know, that people might be struggling with that internalized weight bias. Um, it really impacts people's physical, emotional, and behavioral health. And so um, we can also do that by replacing any weight stigmatizing language too. So not using terms like obesity. Um, if someone else uses that to, de to describe someone else, definitely correct them, right? Um, but if someone uses that to describe themselves, validate their emotions and their experience, but don't correct them because that's the way that they, they're kind of identifying themselves. Um, and then keep conversations about weight, health, and body positivity going, right? So there's so much to learn, um, but there's so much to both learn and unlearn um, about what it means to be healthy. And I also like to bring up this conversation of body positivity and neutrality. If you spend time on like these spaces in the internet, um, you might see that there's been some like, um, I guess like controversy, but like not not a lot of controversy between the two, um, where they're both kind of getting at the same thing. Um, they're kind of just different terms and they go about it differently. And so just have this information and know that you can 
practice both at the same time and they kind of get the same job done. Um, and so there's definitely benefits to both, right? So body positivity um, is a social movement rooted in the belief that um, all human beings should be um, or should have, you know, a positive body image um, while challenging the ways in which society presents and views um, what the body should look like, right? Um, so there's messages of, you know, challenging societal body ideals and messages, messages of empowerment in doing that, um, popularizing bodies that fall outside of the ideal, encouraging self-love. And so those all sound like really great things. So with body neutrality, um, basically aims to do it in just a tad of a different way where it aims to encourage you to accept your body that you're in and focus on its achievements rather than its appearance. Um, too often we fall into kind of like a black and white thinking trap of either loving or hating our bodies. So I think it's important that like this also provides an opportunity for that middle ground of acceptance if that's where you are that day, right? So um, someone who might be practicing body neutrality might say, you know, my arms allow me to hug the people that I care about, you know, and if that's the most that you can appreciate your body that day, that's great. You know, that's a big step forward. And if the next day you're like, I'm really pretty today. Wow. You know, then that's just another part of body positivity. So um, there's messages here with, you know, existing without placing any emphasis on your body, um, focusing on what your body does for you rather than appearance, removing any perceived pressure of practicing positivity. Some people might feel that way at some times and some people don't. So um, just using that term neutrality might be what someone needs one day. Um, and then encouraging acceptance. Um, because you know, positivity and acceptance kind of fluctuate throughout, town, throughout time. And so both of these approaches challenge what the messages of health um, and beauty that the industry tells us, and both have value and can be used by the same person. And so this leads to the last topic, which is health at every size. Um, so I thought it would be appropriate to kind of talk about how this this important movement that could provide some additional support in maintaining um, a weight and body inclusive environment um, and moving beyond the definitions of health brought on by measures like the BMI and diet culture. Um, so this movement is called Health at Every Size. So I want to uh, just start this off with a little disclaimer that um, I am not certified or affiliated with Health at Every Size at this stage in my career. Um, however, it informs uh, my research, my practice, my, my approach to life. Um, and it is something that I um, very much support um, and you know, encourage other people to, to be more involved in. And so basically this movement is dedicated to promoting size acceptance, ending weight discrimination, and promoting health holistically outside of a weight-centered approach. So much of what diet culture and the majority of mainstream healthcare and research does center on. And so uh, what are the determinants of health, right? So we've kind of touched upon this so far, but here are just kind of those categories. Um, so these actually do more and determine health more than the actual weight status of an individual. So that is physical and physical is not just weight, but it's everything, right? Um, it is any health conditions that you might have, or it's healthful behaviors, like do you exercise? Do you rest? Um, do you move your body at all? What does that look like? We have social. Um, how are your relationships going, right? That 100% impacts health. Um, spiritual. Are you spiritual? Do you have a religion? Do you just follow sp spiritual practice? Um, do you practice positive affirmations for yourself? What, is, what does that look like for you? Um, occupational. So do you like your job? Is it fulfilling? Is it stressful? How does it fit into your life? And then emotional. Um, how do you treat yourself? You know, how do you take care of yourself? How do you validate yourself? And so examples of practicing healthful behaviors in these areas would be like intuitive eating, physical activity, restful sleep, social support, um, and overall, that weight does not equal health, unlike what the BMI and the uses of the BMI might suggest to us. And so uh, health at every size has several principles. And so um, it starts with weight inclusivity, which means to respect the diversity of body sizes and reject um, the idealizing or pathologizing of certain weights. 
Um, so mainly don't idolize smaller bodies and don't demonize larger bodies. That's what that means. Um, health enhancement, which uh, encourages health policies that improve and equalize access to services and personal practices that improve well-being. Um, so that includes those social determinants of health, like we just talked about. Um, eating for well-being. So this means promoting flexible eating based on hunger, satiety, um, nutritional needs, pleasure, rather than for eating for weight control solely. Respectful care. So this means to be mindful of our own biases, like weight bias, um, and work to end weight stigma by understanding that race, gender, age, body size, and many other identities actually impact the experience of weight stigma and they create environments. Um, then we wanna create environments to actually address those inequities. Um, and then life enhancing movement. So this means to encourage joyful physical activities for people of all body sizes and abilities um, because exercise looks different for all of us. So we talked about a lot today. Um, so BMI um, actually doesn't mean anything other than relationship, the relationship between your weight and your height. Um, and uh, it's just a, you know, a measure of population. It doesn't measure actual health. Um, and it is actually an incorrect formula at that. <laughs> um, Hayes provides a framework to work from and to live with to practice healthful living, body positivity and acceptance. And overall, our culture's declared war on obesity and the reliance on the BMI as a health indicator has resulted in significant harm to individuals across the size spectrum, across identities. Um, its harm is physical and emotional through decreasing health coverage, denial of routine health care, increased weight stigmatization. So measures like the BMI don't accurately reflect health um, and often lead to ineffective recommendations from providers rather than recommendations that enhance health. Um, and I did also provide some resources here too. Um, so these are just things that you can kind of look up in your own time. Um, I love podcasts, so I included some, um, some weights, uh, websites for um, weight and intuitive eating and inclusivity in those domains. And then some Instagram accounts that I follow. Um, I think it's really important to change what your social media looks like um, to also adapt to a body positive and neutral um, outlook. So, you know, remove those messages as much as possible. Well, thank you everybody so, so much for jumping on. Kelsey rocked it. This was one of my favorite, if not my favorite, but don't tell everybody webinars ever. So this is just absolutely beautiful and I really appreciate it. Some awesome feedback, some awesome conversation. Again, all of that will be taken out so no worries there and tons of thank yous in the chat box are coming through a reminder to check out clarity fitness and online.clarityfitness.com that's where you can find a ton more webinars like this one i'm trying to recruit kelsey to do a support and community group of her own as long as it doesn't stress her out with school so that's maybe in the making and we're definitely going to keep these conversations going i'm a body positive facilitator and eating disorder survivor and got some knowledge with the fitness stuff in terms of gym ownership and personal training. So I'd love to be in community with you guys in any capacity that is needed. I'm totally reachable on that Clarity Fitness website. Just send an info at clarityfitness.com email and I'll get it. And I would love to see you guys on our Thursday body positive community groups. They're this week starting at five o'clock PM Eastern time. And it's just a half hour, totally free. I'm coaching it. And it's just another conversation like this every week. You can listen in with your video and your sound off and listen to it like a podcast and not be involved if you're doing other stuff. Or you can be as engaged and involved as you want. It's totally a space meant for you. It's not for anything else. And it's through uh, Clarity Online. So online.clarityfitness.com. You get 30 days totally free and then access to our entire live mental health platform and tons of on-demand fitness resources are all body positive, of course. It's just $14.99 a month. So it's a super easy subscription, just adding some tools to your toolbox and you can use them as you want. And I hope that that's a cool resource for you guys in your body positive journeys. And again, a massive, massive thank you to the queen of the hour. Thank you so, so much for your awesome topic. This was great. And I'm thank wishing you guys an awesome night. Yay. <laughs>
<laughs> wishing you guys an awesome night and stay safe out there. And thank you again for coming and we'll be in touch. Bye everybody.